Well, good morning. It's actually a really great show so far, and I'm really looking forward to uh, everything that's coming up today. Uh, a lot of great sessions yesterday and a lot of great uh, hall talks. And they mentioned it yesterday, but, you know, definitely do take advantage of that. Um, you know, just walk up to somebody and ask them how their last session was. So, uh, you know, when I was walking around yesterday, um, a lot of the themes came out uh, when speaking with you guys about taking these large systems and trying to break them down. It was interesting to, to hear all the different stories about that. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, Home Depot has been working on this for a little while, and we've actually been uh, um, using evolutionary architecture to help us with that. So as I mentioned, my name is Christopher Grant. I am a senior architect at, at HomeDepot.com. You can find me online at C. Grant. Um, I've been uh, in the industry for about 20 years now, and uh, uh, interestingly, uh, so has uh, the HomeDepot.com site. So this is our awesome site back in 1996. This was state of the art at the time. I think we even had image maps on the uh, store finder app there. So this is actually how a lot of the uh, uh, systems start these days, right? So, so you start out with something small, lean, and mean. And then over time, you, you add features and functions into it. And then you end up with something that's a little bit bigger, a little bit more difficult to manage. It was the same way with the HomeDepot.com site. So in 2011, we had this you know, two gig deploy. Uh, it took over an hour. We had three month long release cycles. We really didn't have any CI or testing, uh, automated testing involved. And we, we actually had a you know, two to four hour uh, outage when we wanted to deploy. So this is definitely something that was gonna uh, challenge us uh, going forward. So we took, we took a note of that and we said, hey, how are we gonna change this? We wanna do things. Well, the first thing for us was really to take a look at what our, our key objectives were. So we knew we had a lot of things in the horizon. We wanted to increase the rate of change. We wanted to bring in a whole lot of new developers, but we had to maintain that one billion in sales that we were making at the time. So we started with uh, Agile, so we changed our, our process. So we were doing waterfall methodology previously, and Agile was actually new to the organization. So uh, switching from those three month release cycles with blocks of time for testing, and trying to push for those weekly deploys was, was a, an initial challenge, but we worked with the teams, we, we educated people on that, and it worked out well. So now we had a process down. We had to actually work on how do you break this up technically. So we looked at our, our big monolith. We said, hey, what are, the, what are the main pieces here? And we found that there's kind of this e-commerce side, and there's kind of this browse and catalog shopping side. And so we decided that we were going to start out with the browse side. And we, we decomposed that even further. And we said, hey, we've got Store Finder again, and we've got the product pages search and catalog pages, all these different things. So we kind of took them piece by piece, and we piloted one of them. Uh, and once we learned some lessons from that, we moved on. And we did this across all of the, uh, all of the different applications. So the next piece is now that we're ready to get started, what were we going to do? We, we needed to really check on our, our automation, right? So we, in, we, we uh, in, installed continuous integration, you know, Sonar, Jenkins, Nexus, all of these tools. You know, really, you know, bake in our quality. So the automation was key at the time. We added automated testing and unit testing, all the rest of that. But we also wanted to take account what was going to happen in the future. So, so we were in the middle of an initiative right now. We were managing day-to-day uh, uh, -day operations, trying to do something new. And we knew things were going to happen in the future that we weren't ready for. So we decided that we were going to architect for that. So we implemented APIs. We abstracted out a uh, front end from the back end. And this was actually really, really helpful for us for some specific changes that we knew were coming, as well as uh, things that, that turned up later that we didn't have, a, have an, uh, a clue about. All right, so here we are. We've got you know, our APIs, we're ready to go. But the operations team is asking us, how do we roll this out you know, safely? So we introduced the idea of feature throttles. And a couple other companies were doing it at the time. Uh, this really saved us uh, a lot of headache in how we were rolling things out, because we can roll things out to 10% of the audience, uh, we can roll it out to 50% of the audience, and then once we really felt comfortable, we roll it out to 100%. And these can be really complicated, or these can be really simple. So how did we do? We did pretty well. So we went from one app to 30 apps. We increased our sales to 5 billion, and we increased our developer count to 300, and we are uh, uh, deploying weekly. But we're not done. So last year, we started this large initiative to take the e-commerce side, uh, the, the transactional side, and decompose that as well. So we also taken the entire stack, and we're making it more cloud native and putting it in, up in the cloud. So we're continuing the practices. We're looking at how do we change things. 
And um, you know, evolutionary architecture has really been you know, helpful in that for us. But how did we actually use evolutionary architecture to do this? So I had been calling this iterative architecture. We were you know, in Agile and everything, and Agile's iterative, right? The operations team I, I was with, uh, uh, they had a different opinion. They, they, they jokingly called this, you know, changing the wheels while we're driving down the highway at 55 miles an hour. You know, and sometimes it can feel like that, you know, what, what's going on? We're, we're trying to do too much at, at one time. Uh, but really, this is all about evolutionary architecture. And for us, that starts with a vision, right? It's not reactive. We actually have a direction that we want to get to. Uh, so definitely have that vision, but you want to uh, also understand the objectives of your organization. Are you shooting for scalability? Are you shooting for flexibility? Do you have some, uh, uh, some unique streaming constraint that you need to have? When you have that, choose what, what matters. There's a lot of companies out there, a lot of information out on the internet talking about the right way to do microservices, the right way to do this architecture. Not all of that is necessarily going to apply to your organization. It reminds me of a story. Um, uh, somebody got the Gang of Four book, and they said, hey, look, I've got all of these patterns except for this one in my app. How do I get this one pattern in my app? Right? And it's the same way as what we're looking at here. It's not a matter of putting all of that stuff in your app. So choose what matters and prioritize the rest. And definitely implement in stages. So, so take your vision, chunk it out into achievable goals. But not only implement it in stages, but talk to your, your team and your organization about those achievable markers. It, it, you know, make it more acceptable and adoptable for them so that they can understand where you're going and how you're going to get there. So this is always the big one. How do I break down my, my system into smaller chunks that I can actually work with? So one of the good ways is to actually look at your business, understand the business functions, understand the domain spaces. Uh, also look at the people. So Conway's law is actually a real thing that I've seen a lot. Uh, we talk about it here, but it's a real thing. You know, look at the team structures. They tend to organically turn into uh, uh, the different uh, uh, functional areas. Data models are another thing. So you know, data might get all crammed into one database, but how people are pulling it out tends to also be some of those boundary markers that you can use to, to break down your app. And then there's always those hard things in the site that everybody wants to kind of stay clear of. They're like, oh, don't touch that. That's going to break if you touch that, right? Everybody has that. So those are also some indicators of boundary areas that maybe you want to kind of carve off and, 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 and treat as a separate thing. But really, we're talking about change here. This is all about how do you change for the future. So design your architecture in a way that, that it adopts and can uh, accept future changes that are coming. So change is going to happen, and you can either have change happen to you, or you can make change happen. And we want to be proactive about how we're doing this. We want to make change happen in our architecture mindfully. This is a big one, though, uh, delaying until the last responsible moment. So we like to put in those abstraction layers early. We like to prepare for the future and say, hey, look, I'm ready. But try to push off your decisions until the last minute that you have to. There's going to be new information that's coming in that's going to change how you're thinking, some new technology that's a little bit better, a little bit different. And you want to be able to, to accept and adopt that. Now, there's going to be some rework in this process, right? So maybe I don't put in that abstraction layer now, and I want to come back and I add it in layer later. There's going to be some refactoring in that. That's OK. You know, and actually, microservices, they talk about replacement instead of reuse, right? So replace your service instead of you know, upgrading it or, or changing it. Uh, and so that's acceptable. You know, try to minimize it where possible. And of course, the final thing is, how do I implement this safely, right? So this is really the big thing. You know, we have to maintain our operations and, and our state. So clearly, you know, automation makes things reliable, right? So, so start with your automation, uh, but then don't just stop, right? Next time you implement something, see if there's another piece of automation that maybe you need to add or you could add in there. So this is an interesting one. Um, in place versus greenfield. So you know, as engineers, we really want to you know, start creating the new thing. You know, every time you get to a new system, you want to throw the old stuff away. That's just the way we are, right? But actually starting and, and doing microservices and, and architectural changes within your existing system is a great way to start. So you know, one of the things that we actually did when we first started is that we took 
uh, a piece of our site, and we implemented an API on that within that monolith. And then we actually made calls out of our system back into the same exact system. And this was really just to get our understanding of how APIs were going to work, how our operations team was going to work with this, and, and how could we start decoupling this. So it's a nice way to, to actually start implementing these things and get your feet wet. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, feature switchers and traffic throttles, uh, uh, these are great techniques. Um, these can be really simple. And we, when we started out, we actually just had a couple if statements actually in our code, right? So these things can be really, really simple. You know, as you get comfortable with them, you can add in databases. Um, you can add in infrastructure. We ended up with a beta site, and now we're doing canary deploys. So you know, it doesn't need to be this humongous thing. You can start out really simply uh, and add some of these throttles, and it's a safety net for you and your operations team. And finally, it's uh, encouraging separation. So, you know, you know, we were told to build bridges and not walls, and, and you break down those barriers. And when you're dealing with a monolith, it's actually kind of the opposite. We actually want to start to build those separations, right? So if you have a system and you go through the, do the work to break it down technically, and then your teams still treat the whole thing as one, just one humongous monolith, you're not really getting the gains that you want out of it. You're going to test everything together. You're going to try to deploy everything together. You're going to have this distributed monolith. So use things like uh, uh, contract-based testing, uh, you know, interface boundaries, you know, push teams to actually release completely independently with, with less uh, communication, and, uh, and work through that independence. It's going to be one of the larger changes uh, for the organization. So these really are some of the things that, that, that we've worked through. Uh, the evolutionary architecture concepts are, are kind of throughout here, maybe with some different names. But the concepts are things that are going to help uh, you guys as well uh, try to transition from, microservice, from monolith to microservices. So thank you very much.